Now here's today's map, just under 200 kilometres, heading east out of Ayin as the race gets ready to return to the coast tomorrow. Two third category climbs along the route, but they're just making up the numbers really and adding to the fatigue before the final one, the Chorette de Cati and the descent from the top of it. Once again, there was a big break, 21 riders in it, including three from Bora Hansgra, one of whom was Rafael Maika, so some serious climbing ability in there. The best placed rider, though, was Moby Star's Nelson Oliveira at 3 minutes 2 seconds behind Chris Froome. As we join the race, he's the red jersey on the road, although the road, of course, still has the final climb on it. Sergei Chinetsky, this is his modus operandi. This is how Chinetsky wins bike races, actually. He's a, a very much in the... Oh, what's the phrase? I'm not entirely sure that is, actually. I will stand corrected if that's the case, but Astana have got uh, Chinetsky and Lawrence de Fraser in the breakaway. And there they go. Borough Bor have responded immediately. And uh, it is... Uh, this is going to turn into a little bit of an interesting... It's an interesting move by him. You see, that's, that's now just sets the... Set the cat amongst the pigeons in the breakaway. Now that everyone's just anticipating Bora Hansgrohe taking, dragging them to the bottom of the climb, and now they're all a little bit confused because Bora Hansgrohe have not only just stopped, they sent a rider up. So, huh. so that's uh, now everyone's going to have to reset how they're racing this final. Well, that is Christoph Fingston, who's done his job, um, and we, we talked about him taking the race to the foot of the climb, and it hasn't quite panned out that way because Borda Hansgrohe have decided to launch Emmanuel Buchmann onto the wheel. If, uh, absolutely right, they are, and that is Lawrence de Fraser, um, the Belgian rider from Astana. So I correct myself there. Chinetsky would be their uh, next card if they want to play that, and he's a very, very strong rider. They shouldn't be underestimated. And Astana have had a good race so far, already taking a stage victory uh, with Alexei Lutsenko. Well, that's a, a good move by Bora Hansgrohe. Instead of just uh, moronically riding on the front, trying to pace it back, they've they've sent Buchmann up there, and Buchmann's just checking behind. He doesn't have to commit fully to this, but just keep it away, because now he's got Mike in the, in the driving seat as well. Unless, for all we know, because we haven't seen Buchmann do much riding, he's the, he's the person they're, they're setting this up for, which would be quite a clever double bluff. Um, but Micah now is back in this group, and yeah. just to sit on and just follow moves with the, the right that he has. You see him, he's sitting just in the middle of the group, almost exactly in the middle of that group, which is the best place to be, because he just wants to almost switch off and let everyone else panic about this. He doesn't need to panic about anything, he's got a teammate up the road. Well, it was initially, I mean, the reason we thought Buchmann was solely working for Micah was because Finkston and Buchmann went to the front as a pair very, very deliberately and very obviously. That said, David, we didn't actually ever see Buchmann putting his nose in the wind. It was just about Fingston. So it could be that they've, <clears throat> like you say, protected Buchmann and Micah, and they're, they're going to play both cards as and when. Which is exactly what they're doing right now. 12k to go for the peloton. Team Sky on the right-hand side of the road, Astana, who've got this move uh, going on, so they won't be contributing with any great vigor with a couple of riders on the left. Trek Segafredo, I think, very keen to look after Alberto Contador and see if he can continue his resurgent form on this climb. It's the Fraser and uh, Emmanuel Buchmann hold sway at the oh, front. There you go, so Buchmann is, he is protecting uh, Maika, or he's just going to play that card with De Vresa, and De Vresa's just given the hand signal like, you know what, forget about it, he's just going to carry on. Uh, because, yeah, that's, this is the perfect situation. Buchmann can claim he's not going to contribute to this ride at the front because he's got his team leader behind. Team leader behind isn't going to contribute to anything because he's got a teammate up the front. So, so they are in the driving seat still. But De Vreza, I think his job is to, to help his teammate there in the breakaway by doing, as we see more, more and more often, it's just by going up the road and allowing him to now get a, get a free ride behind. Hence why De Fraser didn't let himself get too worked up by the fact that Buchmann wasn't going to ride. He just gave a little hand signal saying, you know what, forget about it. I know what's going on. So he's just going to push on because it will benefit his teammate behind. And he knows, you see, you can just see how big he is. This isn't a climb that's going to suit him in the slightest. He will, uh, he will be essentially going backwards compared to the climbers when they head that. So he may as well keep pushing on now. Uh, by the way, if you think that's the climb they're about to go up, it's not. That is just, just the castle that overlooks the town. That's like a Giro time trial. <laughs> Mind you, some of the gradients on this uh, Chorette de Cati are not far off those. 20% gradients await the uh, race, and the climbing starts with 7.9k to go, so the breakaway group is nearly there. As we go back to the peloton, who are just uh, rolling through town now. Three and a half minutes further down the road, Lawrence de Freze and Emmanuel Buchmann are about to be caught by... There's Bora Hansgrohe on the front as well, so he's, he's, oh, he's good. Thinks it's Fingston. He's back yeah. on again, so he's got back he, on. He's off the back. That's yeah. remarkable. 
unzipped and uh, overheating and back in the race. What a ride he's having, Christoph Fingston. Lars well, de Freze himself is a lead-out man for Guadini. That's his normal role um, with Astana, so this is unfamiliar territory for him too. And there's Michael in fifth position now, so he's moved up slightly. So he's obviously feeling very good. The fact he's calling these shots, you know, he'll have told Buchmann to go, he'll have told, told his other teammates to get on the front as soon as he's got back on. So all this is pointing towards that Micah is confident and, and feeling that he's got the legs to do this. Otherwise, you probably would have said to Buchmann, carry on, ride, They're like take this one, I'm just going to sit back here, I'm not feeling so good. But uh, he has been ordered not to ride at the front. They're on the official start of the climb, already a couple of hundred metres into it as Christoph Fingston gets back onto the front remarkably and uh, drives it on once again. The first kilometre of this climb has a gradient of 2%, and then that's it. And then there are four kilometres of really hard climbing, the middle three of which are nightmarishly steep. There you are, maximum gradient, 18%. I'm led to believe from people who know the climb better than me that it actually goes higher than that. 5k in total, as, but as I say, the first uh, kilometre that they're on right now is barely a climb at all. And it's very important to be at the front. If you want to stand any chance in this climb, you need to be right at the front because when you hit climb that steep, it's, you're already going to be, find yourself having a time gap to the front riders because everyone's just going to go so slowly. Here we go. Now, Fingston surely won't be on the front for very much longer. There's a yeah, one last forlorn flick of the elbow, and that probably is the last we'll see of Christoph Fingston for the rest of the day. Right. Don't, don't forget, sorry, just to explain, this isn't a, a summit finish, so to speak, today. When they get to the top of the categorised climb, there are 2.9 kilometres of racing still to go, most of which are downhill before it just kicks up within the final kilometre, ever so slightly. It's not a real climb, but it's just a kind of little kick up towards the finish line. But it, is an it does provide quite an interesting sprint finish because it is a... a it is a kicker, especially after you've done this. So it isn't all over once you go over the top. Buchmann on the front. Micah looming large now for the first time, moving from that uh, berth that he's carved out for himself right in the middle of the bunch. He's been keeping himself nicely on the, in the wheels, saving energy for this very moment on the steeper sections of the climb. And Alaphilippe was looking very... Uh, had a little spring in his pedal stroke as well there as he was just coming up very quickly to Rafa Micah. He knows that's the man he's got to watch out for. Because Alaphilippe, let's not forget, he has a vicious sprint on him. Yep. So if he can stay with those front riders, get over. We know he descends well. He, if he's with it, even with a group of 15, he could probably win that sprint. But if he's with a group of two or three, you would expect him to be the rider that could, that could win that group. Now that, there you go. You can see it's already happened. We've got the strongest rider. So Buchmann's doing a great job. Rafa Maika. Then it's, uh, then we've got Alaphilippe, and and then Serge Pals is the fourth guy. So those are riders proven by Serge Pals and slight difficulties there. But Alaphilippe looking great on, on Micah's wheel. And that is not the rider that Micah wants to have with him. No. Micah's going to have to get rid of him before the top. So the moment the bookman comes up, that's when Micah has to really dig deep. Oh, but Alaphilippe is totally in control. I mean, that's, that's going to be... There you go. But Bookman's now done. Yeah, he's asking uh, to go a little bit further, but it's like, I don't think he can. <laughs> I don't think he can. Serge Pauls is uh, in contact just about with that blue jersey of Alaphilippe, but it looks like uh, that selection has been made, and Micah and Alaphilippe will... Uh, will be the best on this climb. Mike is looking pretty good too. Yes, he but he's going to use his teammates up as much as possible. Because I mean, you can see the, the, the size, the scale of that effort that Buchmann's done, There's, because the gap he's opened up. And look at look at even Serge Powers, who is, who is a recognized climber, couldn't hold on to it. They've only they've just got one rider left with them, and it's a one rider they did not want, Alaphilippe. It's, uh, he would have been like earmarked within that group as a rider they have to get rid of, and that's not easy. So Sunweb, who have been in the midst of controversy, having sent Warren Barguil home, uh, fascinatingly, for not working for Sam Oman and his designated leader, Wilco Kelderman, they're on the front now. And Oman and Kelderman are, are racing really well themselves. They show themselves at the front. And uh, in the meantime, it's worthy of note that the uh, virtual race lead of Nelson Oliveira is now no longer the case. The gap is under three minutes, the three minutes and two seconds that uh, Oliveira was trying to defend. That's it for... Uh, Emmanuel Buchmann, so Rafa Maika finds that he's got all men. <laughs> Julian Alaphilippe sitting on his wheel and buzzing around him like a fly. 5.7k to go, that means that there's slightly less than 3k to the top of this climb. So there's two things that's going to happen here, is the fact that Rafa Maika has to get rid of Alaphilippe. Alaphilippe doesn't necessarily have to get rid of Maika because he can beat him in the sprint, but at the same time he wants to keep, keep that rest of that group away. So. It's in his interest now to just work with Micah and keep all those other riders away because otherwise it just gets more complicated. Look, he's talking to Micah there. He's probably saying, look, let's just work together. That's uh, obviously as you'd say that because he knows he can beat him in a sprint. But there you go, he's just checking. But he looks completely in control. To be honest, he looks like he could sit up and write a shopping list. Yeah. 
and one of those things on his shopping list is a stage win on a Grand Tour. Is this going to be the day for Julien Alaphilippe? Julian Alaphilippe reacting to an acceleration from Rafa Maika. They've been joined by Niemniec and by Serge Pals after they just relaxed the pace a little bit, these two. But once again, they are asserting themselves as the best two climbers on these nasty, nasty steep slopes up this famous climb on the Velta. The Charret de Cati once again providing us with drama and these two very, very evenly matched. Yeah, he's not going to be dropping uh, Alaphilippe and Alaphilippe's making sure that Maika recognises that. At the same time, you can see the two of them there. Now they pause again, yep. because uh, Alaphilippe's just going to be a little bit careful. He knows how strong my career is. He doesn't want to put himself in too far into the red. It's not up to Alaphilippe to distance to distance Micah, because he knows he can beat him in a sprint. So they are stuck in this little bit of a checkmate, and that's where these riders can try stand a chance of getting back on again, getting back on terms. But again, there you go. He's just sitting there near him, just marking him, Alaphilippe. Now, Micah, this one is steeper sections. You can see it there. Look, I mean, it's rare you can really see how steep the road is. And there, Micah knows he's going to try and push him again. Still got some climbing to go, although the steeper sections, the steepest sections are nearly over, nearly past them. Five kilometres to go for the leaders. There's 37 seconds back to what remains of the, and that's how quickly those gaps can open up, of that big breakaway group. Uh, containing Nelson Oliveira and Jan Polantz, the big threats on the general classification. But that threat has been nullified, at least temporarily, as the red jersey group comes within 2.55 of the front of the race. But don't forget, Oliveira is some way back further down the climb. The pace has stalled again slightly, so it looks like Niemniec might be able to get across again temporarily. One of the Yates brothers going now, so one of the Yates has launched off. David De La Cruz on his wheel, Michael Woods, I presume. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, Chris Freem's only got one rider left there at the front by the looks of it. I presume it's probably Moscon from, from previous, previous uh, these last few days. He's got two teammates left, and Wout Pals. And uh, Chris, they're looking back at Chris Froome, he's in the middle of that group. Looks like it's Franco Pellizzotti and uh, Vincenzo Nibali from those two red jerseys from Bari Merida. <coughs> Contador is looming uh, on the wheel of the uh, Nibali group as well, as if he's about to attack. So interesting. There's uh, Nelson Oliveira in what remains of the breakaway, a bit further up the road. And it's a Yates. A oh, Yates. I'm afraid I can't tell you which one just yet from this distance. And Michael Woods and David de la Cruz. Just got a few bike lengths advantage over the front of the race and another brutal ramp towards the top of the climb. Niemniec, I think it's Niemniec, or is that Polantz actually? It might be Polantz, the other UAE team Emirates rider. Looks like he's just battling to get on terms, but another big dig from Rafa Maika might just dispense with him. And in the meantime, further back down the road, Yates goes again. He's pushing on here and it's good to see him back and form. We haven't seen him really at the sharp end of the race so far. I think it's got to be Simon. Yeah. <laughs> well, the only reason I say that I'll is because Adam. I'm well, I'm expecting Adam to be in the, with the red dossard on his back for the best young rider. Yeah, it's, uh, we'll see, but it's like Michael Woods looking good as well. He's he running is. quite an intelligent race. He's not actually being the attacker, if you like. He's, he's just marking, much like we're seeing up here. It's Micah that attacks, it's Alaphilippe, Alaphilippe that marks. And uh, this, every steep section we've seen, Micah has given another dig, as he has to. But it's uh, it's proving to no avail as of yet. But you can see they do because come look how sl look at he's just giving you a head signal. Come on, let's ride. But look how steep that is there. I'm trying to remember if my memory serves me correctly. Last year's Tour de France, there was a breakaway group containing Micah, Yarlinton Pantano, and Julian Alaphilippe. And Alaphilippe had a mechanical, didn't he? On a descent, yeah. On a descent. Entire. And they got absolutely incensed. And then it just left Micah and Pantano. And everyone thought Micah's got this wrapped up, and Pantano sprung him on the finish line. Now, what's happening further back down the road in the GC race? Looks like Simon Yates, if that is indeed Simon Yates, has been joined by Michael Woods, and Contador has launched an attack. That would have been expected. Is that Contador? So there's Chris Frins right at the back of this group. Look, look, there he is, the red jerseys, the last red jersey you see in that group, next to the other Yates brother. So I guess that next to Adam. There's Chavez on the right now moving up. I mean, this is the time to go. If he's that far back, Chris Froome, and with the, the, the tight road, he can't move up. So it's up to them to attack now, and I'm not sure if they're fully aware of what's going on. Marc Soler is the Movistar rider, showing much better form, much like his senior uh, compatriot, Alberto Contador, rediscovering some of his mojo, and Julian Alaphilippe still has Micah locked on his wheel 
And uh, just, just trying, trying to wave and clear Contador just pushing on again at the front with Michael Woods. Exactly. Yeah, so see Team Sky moving up the side of the road. They've got Chris Froome, and then they're moving him up the side of that bunch. So they've gone back and got him. And it's, I'm not sure. Yeah, there you see. See the Team Sky riders? So that opportunity was lost. If you were going to attack Chris Froome, you had to go then while he was at the back of the group. We know that's a tactic he uses often, just trying to absorb the first section of the steep ramps, spinning, sitting back, letting everyone else go into the red. And that's exactly what he's done here. He's now moving back up, taking, taking back control of that group. Domenico Pozzovivo, uh, two veteran Italians towards the back. Franco Pellizzotti. I think uh, well, there's another AG2 Alla Mondial uh, jersey just ahead. That um, should be Roman Bardet if he's on a slightly better day. Ale Filippo and Micah locked together, though. Still 1.2 kilometres to go. I mean, that's a long way on a climb this steep. But it's, uh, there's Serge Pals just, just plugging away, but he's, he's lost distance now. He's... Uh, there you go, it's just in front. So that's a UAE rider who's there just in front. So he's, that's a fair distance. That's Michael Woods now. He's by this time and now he's going himself. That's the first time we've seen him actually move off the front. Alberto Constor, the only rider that can go with him. This is an exceptional ride from the Canadel Dreadback man, the Canadian. This is brilliant from him. Using those steep slopes that he has said favour him with that running style, if you like. And uh, at the moment, he's putting everybody else that, in that big GC group under pressure, including Alberto Contador. These are men who, just a couple of years ago, he would have dreamed of matching on a climb like this on a Grand Tour. Hats off to Michael Woods, great ride. Serge Powell to Nelson Oliveira, who's not really battling for the stage win, Oliveira. He's just trying to hold on to the GC gains he might be making at the end of the day. Oliveira from Movistar. I'm pretty sure that's Jan Polans, who the rider from UAE Team Emirates, of the two riders. I think it's a slightly smaller one. I think he is the rider in third place. But Alaphilippe and Micah, this duel has been brilliant to watch. And they've still got another kilometre or so of duelling to go. There they are. I think Polantz is going to join them now. Yep, he has made it back on terms yeah, again. Polantz. Yeah. So there we go, three of them. And Jan Polantz, uh, do not uh, discount him. That really would be a result, wouldn't it, <laughs> for Slovenian cycling two consecutive days if he could pull off a victory. Don't forget, he's a two-time Giro d'Italia stage winner, including this year on Mount Etna. And it's, uh, you can just see there that Polans is just plugging away at his own rhythm and that the other two riders are so concerned with marking each other out, they actually let him get a little bit in front of them there for a bit. But then Micah shut it down, shut the door, and now he's going to try and go again because he's, he's not got many chances left because he knows that Alaphilippe, the sprint he has on him, is very, it's a really outside chance that Micah could beat him in a sprint. So he's trying to at least wear him down. If he can't drop him, you may as well try, keep trying to wear him down and take the snap out of his legs for the sprint. One, one kilometres of climbing still to go. That was so hard on Jan Polans. He had just gone so deep into the red there. There's the red jersey of Chris Froome uh, looking at Contador and Woods, and they are coming back. So Contador with Chavez on his wheel, and Roman Bardet finds himself under pressure and going backwards again. But it looks like Chris Froome has managed to close the gap to Woods and to Contador. Yeah, Chris Froome back in the familiar position, driving seat. But down, no teammates left around him now. This is uh, only leaders left. Michael Woods, Alberto, Constable, Chris Froome, Esteban Chavez, Vincenzo Nivelli, and uh, there is uh, Zacharin. Zacharin, yeah. Uh, Simon Yates, if indeed that was Simon who launched that big attack, is also just uh, along with Roman Bardet struggling at the back of that group of favourites. So they still got... Uh, they still got about a K and a half to go with this group till they get to the summit. So still oh, Froome's attacking. Chris, Froome's Chris yeah. Froome goes. Chavez once again, uh, just so alert to that flash of red, that red jersey. And Contador proving that his legs are back once more. As uh, Well, that's a very, very elite selection. And Michael Woods is part of it. Credit to him. He's not been dropped, having been uh, on the offensive. He uh, is holding on to that group that contains Chavez, Contador, and that, uh, that very, very familiar trademark style of Chris Froome in the red leader's jersey. Wow, look at this. It's all or nothing now, Micah. It's just gonna, he's got to try and crack him. If he doesn't do this now and again, he just, he, that was it. It just shakes it. It's like, oh, come on. So, but that was it. I mean, he saw the length of that attack. He knows that he's got to try and get rid of him. And I think that would have been the last chance he had. Ah, oh, Froome goes again. Contador reacts. Chavez for the first time. Unable to go with him. And uh, Vincenzo Nibali goes past uh, the Colombian. And his head drops as he watches Contador and Froome go into the distance. Now, can Contador, that, remember, they have still got a couple more minutes climbing. They are somewhere way back further down the mountain from that point we saw Rafa Micah and Julian Alaphilippe on so there's a little bit more climbing to do before this group that is now down to just two gets over the top of the climb Contador Froome 
Well, this is Constor at his, his Imperial best. We haven't seen this in a long time. It's Chris Rooms just dispatching of each, every rider one by one, but the one he can't get rid of at the moment is Alberto Constor. But as you say, it's still a long way to go to the summer of these. Constor's going to attack him. Yeah, you always know. No, no, that's more just a showing. It's just coming up. That's that's the kind of the psychological games you play. I'm still here. It's just saying, look, I can come by you. It's like, don't worry, you're not letting me. Just sit. And you, it's a kind of bluff in a way as well. You're almost saying, just sit down. You're not going to get rid of me. Don't wait. Don't just keep Please? doing this to both of us. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> just find a nice rhythm that will get, get us over the top now. Can we just have a bike ride now? Just stop hurting us. <laughs> <laughs> Wilco Kelderman and Sam Oman. Now, there's the red jersey of Chris Froome. Where's Contador? Has he been dropped or has he attacked? He wasn't there alongside Froome in that shot. Let's wait to see when we next get a shot of it. In the meantime, this is the battle for the stage win, and Julian Alaphilippe has it. In t Look at him shaking out his sprinter's legs. He's getting ready. Eight. Nine times out of ten from this point, Julian Alaphilippe beats Rafa Maika. Maika knows that, and Alaphilippe knows that. The bluffed and work of Alberto Consolo came up to him, almost uh, trying to threaten Chris Froome, but Chris Froome's obviously such strong, so strong at the moment, he just responded to that in his way and just attacked him again. And Chris Froome's just going through everybody, and this is, he's putting big time into everybody here, because it's still, as you said, it's still about 500 metres to the top, and it's, uh, he's flying. Well, Chris Froome, it's another awesome demonstration. His first week of the Vuelta has been ridden to perfection. One more mountain day to come tomorrow with an uphill finish. But uh, this stage, well, he's just dominated it once again as Nicholas Roach uh, just struggles to maintain his position and hold on to those wheels. And all those riders have just been put into uh, a very, very difficult place by Chris Froome once again and uncharacteristically gets out of the out of the saddle and drives himself up towards the top now not far to go before chris Froome is descending he's one minute and 36 seconds back on uh, rafa mica and julian alaphilippe who are dueling out there uh, consul coming back consul just punched back across again so i think he must have just been caught out slightly by that move before and then it's just slowly pegged it back again so this oh, is that's an immense recovery, immense recovery. and it's extraordinary and, and it's great to see i mean it's just this is if very few riders at their best can do that now alberto consul is doing that well, if you're not on prime form, once you're dropped on a climb like that, there's no way back. So that's a Straight real... Straight by him. Console. And he's there again, and alongside him. And that red jersey, well, the two red jerseys looking at each other. But look, 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 there's no, they're not giving each other any ground. And again, that was just a sort of telling him he's there, but neither of them are going to back down. He may as well let Chris Froome take the lead down. He knows Chris Froome's a great descender. And uh, here we have Palanza again. Is he making it back onto those two riders who no doubt are bluffing around a bit? Because I'm pretty sure that, uh, that he's just going to just going to sit on the back. There you go. Hello. <laughs> What's going on now? Rafa Maika. Now, Alaphilippe has another wheel to try and follow. And Rafa Maika at the moment might have his job cut out to get onto these two. He's going to counter again. Come on, Alaphilippe's got to be ready. Because if Maika, Maika's only chance is he has to jump them beforehand. So this works into Maika's hands because it makes it a little bit more com complicated for Alaphilippe to, to gauge this one now. But it's it. now Maika's only chance is to try and drop back and try and sprint by. Slovenia plays France plays Poland and you do sense in that trio that it's two against one isn't it it's, yeah. it's at the moment it's Rafa Maika and Poland against Alaphilippe and these two well it's just Contador against Froome and how good is that to watch here we go into the barrier section now just a couple of hundred meters to go for the stage win though as Jan Polans leads them around the final corner and Alaphilippe hits the front has he gone too early he looks over his shoulder surely if Alaphilippe sprints now they won't be able to react he goes he opens up an advantage Polans and Micah locked together trying to get back on terms with the Frenchman but it's not going to work look at that gap devastating turn of speed from Alaphilippe he was the favorite of that group of three and he has lived up to that promise and fulfills a dream he takes his first ever stage win on a grand tour victory once again to quick step floors this time though Alaphilippe now not far behind them on the road Chris Froome 10 seconds after Julian Alaphilippe crosses the line finds that Alberto Contador is proving extremely hard to shake off he thought he dropped him on that climb he's dropped everyone else admittedly but the cream has risen to the top and Alberto Contador has just got his mojo back in spades he's been sitting on Froome's wheel ever since they crested the top of that climb in the meantime Vincenzo Nibali heads a group containing uh, well a number of the other favorites I think Esteban Chavez was in that group possibly TJ Van Garderen but it's Froome and Contador now and they're going to just score points over each other and they'll both take time on their other uh, rivals in the general classification there, go. there was a Trek Sega Freda rider that would know that Alberto's coming up, but there's not much he can do now because Chris Freeman, full flight, who is racing his own race, distancing all these, all his GC competitors, and it's uh, so there's not much that Trek Sega Freda riders do, although he's going to try all the same. Here we go, Contador rolls Chris Froome. Does he? No. No, he doesn't, not quite yet. He's just lurking on the wheels, waiting, waiting. 
He has got uh, Jesus Hernandez is the rider in front of him who uh, is there if Contador needs him, can use him, is available for, to, to be of some assistance to his team leader, Jesus Hernandez. And Contador now does roll Chris Froome. He gets past him, opens up one bike length. Will there be a time gap? Does it really matter? Psychologically, perhaps it does. Contador just gets the better of Chris Froome in that thrilling battle between two old Grand Tour victors and rivals. And, and they have uh, just taken chunks of time out of everybody else. Wack Pools is the rider who uh, won on this on this very climb in the Valenciana last year. Nibali, Aru, Zakarin and Chavez alongside him in that group. Only about 13 seconds, but it's uh, uh, still it's a psychological hit to all of them as They've well. all got to be taking time on Chris Froome, they're not exactly. losing time. Chris Froome, don't forget, has the time trial in the bank, TJ Van Garderen in that group as, uh, well, Contador will be the focus of attention for the Spanish media, I am sure about that. Victory, though, went to France and to Julian Alaphilippe. And he was the odds-on winner the moment he reached the top of the climb alongside Rafael Maika and Jan Polens. They were second and third. The remains of the break filled places four to 12. And Alberto Contador led in Chris Froome insofar as their order across the line actually mattered. No time difference between them, but gaps to everyone else. 17 seconds to Nibali, Aru and Chavez. 28 to a group containing the rest of the morning's top 10 minus Yetzer Ball. Simon Yates lost over a minute to Contador and Froome. I suppose you knew you had to drop Alaphilippe on the top of the climb there. He was always going to be faster in the sprint. Yeah, I know it, but it's too short climb, 5Ks. And actually, we know he's good with the short climbs. And But, yeah, I tried to win. In the end, I'm third because I'm a little bit tired. But after they come back, after the stomach problem, i think so it's okay. Vincenzo, ti sei staccato appena prima della cima, però il bilancio non è così negativo. Grazie, lo so che mi sono staccato. <laughs> no, è mancato un po' di fuori giri nel finale, però alla fine eh, un altro giorno difficile è passato. Grazie. So, a first Grand Tour stage win for Julien Alaphilippe, a year late after his misfortune in last year's Tour de France. And Quickstep's fabulous welter continues, three stage wins out of eight now for them. Julian, we were a bit worried about you and, and we were worried about how strong Rafael Micah was going to be on the climb, but you held on. Yeah, I didn't expect uh, that I can uh, I can go so hard on the climb because uh, the, the last kilometer was really, uh, the, was really fast. And also, I, I remember that I had three cases to go. There is a small um, downhill and uh, I can recover, so... I really stay hard on my, in my head and uh, I'm really so happy to, to take the win today. No change in the points or the mountains jerseys today. Or the best young rider non-jersey, that's still with Adam Yates. But he and everyone else in the top ten fall further behind Chris Froome. Esteban Chavez and Nicholas Roach stay second and third, though at 28 and 41 seconds back respectively. Vincenzo Nibali moves past TJ Van Garderen into fourth. And Fabio Aru passed David de la Cruz into sixth. Yet a ball exits the top ten the day after entering it, as expected, so Adam Yates and Michael Wood shunt up, and Ilnor Zakarin is the new tenth place rider. Nelson Oliveira is just outside it for Movistar. Simon Yates slips to 14th after starting the action on the climb today. Alberto Contador gains no time on the leader but moves up to 17th. And if the 17th place rider is going to be his chief rival on the climbs, then Chris Froome can feel pretty good about things as he looks towards his sixth day in the red jersey. Today was the first time that you dropped everyone on the climb. It was a clean break, even if it didn't last a particularly long time. You must take a lot of confidence from that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I took Alberto Contador with me um, just just over the top of the, the last climb, but he's at three minutes on the general classification already, so that, that wasn't a problem for me. Um, but just really happy to, to increase my lead to, to most of my rivals and uh, to be feeling the way I am at the moment after, after obviously, a tough Tour de France. Um, it's, it's a fantastic feeling to be feeling like this.